live from Midtown Atlanta in Studio B. It's the second annual Starters Awards Show. It's the Starties! And now, here is your host, Kristen Ledlow. Good evening and welcome to the Starters' second annual NBA Awards Show, The Starties. I'm your host, Kristen Ledlow, and over the next hour, we're going to hand out some major NBA hardware. We'll run through traditional NBA awards like this season's most valuable player and most improved, while also deciding a few fun categories like the fan of the year and the funniest moment. Also, a little later, we'll say goodbye to the things that we lost this NBA season. and You don't want to miss that touching tribute. But hey, what would the Starties be without the starters? Here to break down the winners, the losers, and the snubs, Skeets, Tash, Trey, and Lee, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Kristen. I can't tell you how close I was to wearing sequins, so I'm glad I didn't. All right, before we get to the awards, I want to explain the scoring system and how we broke this down. We had an impartial panel pick the four nominees, then the four of us went and made our votes, along with you, the Starters fans on Facebook, we tally it up and we hand out the starties. We also have an incredible top 10 plays of the season coming up. It was pretty difficult to pare it down to just 10, but after some blood, sweat, and tears, especially from Lee Ellis, yep. we managed to do it. He hasn't slept in weeks, but let's get to it. Let's try and not make this three hours long. Kristen, our first award. Like the people who use head and shoulder shampoo, NBA rookies know you never get a second chance to make that first impression. Here are the four players who shine brightest in year one of their careers. Your nominees for Rookie of the Year, Nikola Mirotic of the Chicago Bulls, Nerlens Noel of the Philadelphia 76ers, Alfred Payton of the Orlando Magic, and Andrew Wiggins of the Minnesota Timberwolves. And the winner is Andrew Wiggins. There it is. We the knew first it. First starty going to Andrew Wiggins for ROI. I think it makes sense. We'll look at a quick at the voting breakdown to see where everyone, oh, well, there you go. Everyone backing Andrew Wiggins, including the fans, again, on the Starters Facebook page. So what became somewhat of a close race over the last couple of months, I think that's safe to say, Wiggins ends up taking the, uh, the starties here. Yeah, if this award was called Rookie of the Last Two Months, we'd have a debate right now, <laughs> but it's not. It's for the entire season, and Wiggins has been phenomenal, averaging 36 minutes per game. I think that's extremely important and producing in all those minutes. At this point, he's played in every one of his team's games. He has been phenomenal. I I'm extremely impressed by the man who's now carrying the torch as Canada's best player since Steve Nash retired, Andrew Wiggins. Yeah, and some of the guys, you said it, Miritich, Peyton, Nerlens Noel, the other three candidates really, the nominees in this, they have played great yeah. over the last month or two. But you see even there with Andrew Wiggins, he's gotten better yeah. as the season gone on. That, that is not easy for a rookie to rookies do in this often league. hit the wall. We always hear about that, but he's actually picked it up in that second half of the season, which I think really solidifies his case for Rookie of the Year. And that first half of the season, he was missing Kevin Martin, Ricky Rubio, Nikola sure. Pekovic, the main guys on the Timberwolves, and to be able to have any sort of efficiency on both ends without the actual veterans around there is pretty impressive. He might have been sort of a default winner with all the injuries, yeah. but he also earned it. I think if uh, guys like Jabari Parker were still in the race, we'd be looking at Wiggins and say, this is quite the rookie season. You're absolutely right. So there you go, Andrew Wiggins with the Starties Rookie of the Year. Let's keep it moving, though. Kristen, back to you for the next award. Well, they say that defense wins championships. They also say that a watched pot will never boil, but it does, so I don't really know. These are the nominees for the Defensive Player of the Year. Marc Gasol of the Memphis Grizzlies. Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz. Draymond Green of the Golden State Warriors. And DeAndre Jordan of the Los Angeles Clippers. And the winner is Draymond Green. Draymond Green, the Golden State Warriors. Defensive player of the year, according to the starters. This one, a little bit different than the rookie of the year race, where it was a, you know, a unanimous decision for Andrew Wiggins. Lee going with Rudy Gobert, but everyone else, including the fans, taking Draymond Green with the Warriors. We'll get to your okay. reasoning in a second, Lee. Tass, why'd you go with Green? It's really spectacular to watch this guy play. Uh, of all the candidates, he truly plays like a big and a perimeter player. A lot of the times we kind of separate Defensive Player of the Year between bigs and smalls, but he can literally intimidate a guy on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. Guys dribbling into him kind of have to decide, oh, what am I going to do with this guy? 
At the same time, he goes down low and he uses his body and lower body strength to deal with guys inside. I love how Steve Kerr called him a Dennis Rodman. He can truly guard guys one sure. through five. And it's been a long time since a perimeter player has won this award. Mm. And I think Draymond Green truly feels like the best defensive player. Yeah, this award usually going to the bigs. I mean, it's been a while. I think Ron Artest, Meta World Peace, whatever yeah. you want to call him, the last sort of forward to win it. Eight Eight before that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, I think when you look even at the sort of advanced numbers defensively in terms of win shares and defensive rating, it backs up the case for Green. And look, all these guys in the running are, are high on the list Definitely. for both of those categories, but Green, number two in defensive rating, number one in defensive win shares. He's mm -hmm. on the best defensive team in the league. And I argue that they wouldn't even be the best defense in the league if it weren't for him because of all what Taz said, the way Kerr can use yeah, him for sure. to switch on pick and rolls and really just play everyone. He's vital there on defense because I went in to look at this voting thinking maybe Andrew Bogut's really the best defensive player on that team, but Draymond has played almost as many minutes with Andrew Bogut as he's played without, and there's no defense drop-off at all for the Warriors in those minutes just because he can do everything. He makes it so that they can switch, they can play tiny if they really want to. He's just everywhere, and it's pretty cool to see. Lee, why Rudy Gobert, though? Well, I think Draymond Green has been fantastic, but I think Golden State's defense has been better than Utah. But Rudy Gobert has been so impactful since his role change, which was early in January, he's really made a significant improvement to the Utah's defense. In November, they were 25th in defensive ranking. For the month of March, they finished first. Now, I'm not saying that's all him, but I think his presence there really helps in setting the tone for the defense. Now, if you look at what he does when, when other opponents drive into the lane, look at that opponent field goal percentage at the rim compared to those other guys who we know to be shot blockers. That's hugely significant, if you ask me. There you go. And again, that's uh, that's based on an improvement throughout the season. So maybe Draymond, over the course of the whole season, has been better. But I think Rude's improvement and the impact he's had since his role has improved has made him my defensive player. This was a crazy category. And again, the impartial panel picking only four nominees. But I think you could have had a whole other four or five guys in the mix here. Kawhi Leonard, Absolutely. Tim Duncan, two yeah. guys with the San Antonio Spurs, one of the best defenses in the league. Tony Allen's always going to be in the mix. Nerlens Noel, Andrew Bogut. I mean, you could really, you really could have ten solid nominees here, and then trying to pick one. Yeah, yeah, and I think with Kawhi Leonard, for example, he missed some time, and that probably counts against him sure. a little bit. But since he's been back, he's been great. And Andrew Bogut as well, another one who sometimes I think even gets overlooked. Just his presence there really yeah. helps Golden State. And that's where I think we're, with Draymond Green, as fantastic a defender as he is, I think he can afford to be a little more aggressive knowing you've got such a big body behind I agree, behind but Bogut him. missed a good chunk yeah. of games. That's when he wanted. the defense stayed yeah. at a very high level. He did, he did. But, uh, you know, again, that's when I was making my decision. I just felt Rudy has made such a huge impact on Utah since he's been the starting center for that team. All right, so there it is. Draymond Green getting defensive player of the year. Let's keep it going. I know we have a fun award coming up here next. Back to Kristen. Ah, the NBA fans. Without them, every single player would be perfect from the free throw line. But guys, tell us about the nominees for Fan of the Year. Yes, Fan of the Year nominees, first nominee. It's just this kid chugging <laughs> popcorn. That's not a bad new technique, is that it? That is a brilliant technique. Nom, 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 nom. He's not getting his hands covered in butter. No, or not salt. everywhere. It's perfect. <laughs> and he's just going to town here. How many bags of popcorn did he eat during this game? He's really crushing it, for sure. The second nominee, not a traditional fan, Clippers owner Steve Ballmer, oh, yeah. giving it during a live Fergie performance. <laughs> call it dancing, call it whatever you want. Uh, you got to love this man's energy. <laughs> People around him just start copying him. Yeah, it's I contagious. Not. I still yeah. can't. I can't believe that's not a loop. Uh, our third nominee for Fan of the Year, it's Gary Harris's mom. She missed her son throwing down a huge dunk early in the season. She can't believe it. Come on, mom, where were ya? She can't. She probably just turned her head for a second. Gary throws down the dunk. She that was shocked. his first game, too. Where'd you go, mom? This fan, the last nominee, she got it right in the kisser. Now, why is she fan a nominee here, a Fan of the Year? Because she stayed in the game. She yeah. fought through yeah. a bloody nose. She yeah. hung out there despite getting her glasses knocked off her face. She's a trooper. Oh, and the winner is... <laughs> oh, her given name. Woman Crushed by Pat. Yes! Uh. I'm glad she got this. She deserves she it. Did, right. yeah. She stuck it out. Yeah. We have seen this clip probably a hundred times now. Gets better every time. Yeah. On the show, she the hair fun. going back, the glasses. It was worth it, though. But a well-deserved win. Coming up, the award for sixth man and the year's best wedgies. Welcome back to the Starties. This may be the Starters Award Show, but that doesn't mean they're going to forget about the contributions from the bench. These are the nominees for the sixth man of the year. 
Jamal Crawford of the L.A. Clippers. Maurice Spates of the Golden State Warriors. Isaiah Thomas of the Boston Celtics. And Lou Williams of the Toronto Raptors. And the winner is Lou Williams, guys. Oh. Lou! <laughs> this is a controversial one. Lou Williams of the Raps taking home the six man of the year starties. This was a very close race in terms of the votes. Tass and Trey had Jamal Crawford. Lee and I went with Lou Williams. So the fans really ultimately decided this one. And Lou, in the end, outpaced Crawford by about 40 votes. So again, very close. Was it the Drake shout out? Was it the Drake <laughs> shout out? Who knows? Lee, why Lou Williams for you though? Well, when the statistics are very close as they are between Lou and Jamal Crawford, you have to find some reason to separate them. And for me, it really came down to games played and Jamal has missed a lot of games. Lou Williams has played 76 games to this point. Jamal's only played 60. I think they've both had a similar impact on their team success. And I just really felt that Lou Williams having played more games is deserving of the award. This was a tough one to pick because mm -hmm. No one really stands apart no. from the other guys. Jamal Crawford, Lou, even Isaiah Thomas, they're playing on a couple teams this year. It was a difficult vote. I went with Lou in the end, but why Jamal Crawford? I feel like you guys have voters fatigue. Jamal Crawford no, has I don't. won it too many times for you. He's won it twice to join Kevin McHale, Ricky Pearson, Detlef Shrimp as the only guys to win it twice. This is Jamal's award. He's the leader in points for guys coming off the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, give just, it to yeah. him. Give just. it to him a third time. Just give it to him a third time and name the award after him. It's been a long time coming, just give it to him. Yeah, and he, as Lee is saying, he didn't have, a, he has about the same impact as Lou Williams, but the difference is Jamal Crawford is basically the Clippers bench. There's not much else around there, so when he comes on the court, you know it's gonna be Jamal getting those shots up and scoring, and he's still able to do it. This is a scorer's award, and if you're leading the league in scoring off the bench, might as well get sixth man of the year. That's just how it goes. Lou lost it for me when he took that three-point shot after draining 22 seconds of the shot clock at the end of the game. Wow, game. harsh. Didn't yeah. like that. Just one didn't game. Like <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's really close. Jamal leads in points per game. Yeah, but that's he by is, like less than a point. So. He, he embodies the six man award. Yeah, he does. I, no, I, I do want him to get it just one more time because I feel like this could be his last yeah. season. It would be great actually to name it after him because he has been a great six man for his mm -hmm. entire career. I just don't Thank think you. he's deserving of the, the award support. this year. All right. Well, again, the fans ultimately decided that one. Let's keep it going though. Back to Kristen for the next award. Yeah, guys, behind every great basketball team is a great coach. And behind every great coach is a fan base questioning their every decision. And luckily, these guys have made all the right moves. Here's the nominees for Coach of the Year. Mike Budenholzer of the Atlanta Hawks. Steve Kerr of the Golden State Warriors. Jason Kidd of the Milwaukee Bucks. And Brad Stevens of the Boston Celtics. And your winner is... Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr, the second oh. warrior to take home a start. He's Draymond Green with Defense Player of the Year. Now Steve Kerr with Coach of the Year. All four of us here at the table going with Coach Kerr. Mm -hmm. The fans in the end went with Budenholzer. It was a neck and neck race between Kerr and Budenholzer. It was 50-50, nearly 50-50 split. Yep. In the end, the fans sort of leaning towards Budenholzer. You can't really go wrong with a lot of these guys, but it's tough to pick against Steve Kerr when he's having a historic season with the Warriors. Yeah, when their team is beating points by an average, opponents by an average of 10 points, uh, it's, it's hard not to give it to him. And I think I also gave him a little more credit because he's a rookie head coach. Mm -hmm. and we sort of separate rookies and MVPs because we under, understand their capacity to be great. It's, it's just hard as a rookie. I mean, we talked about it before the season. And yeah. you mentioned Steve Kerr. Can he come in? and make an impact as yep. a rookie head coach and to come in and do what he's doing as a historical season. I know the Hawks are more of a surprise than mm -hmm. the Warriors with them being the first seed, uh, but I, I give a little more credit because this is his first That's year. what some people say. Some people say, whoa, why Steve Curry took over a team that was already a 50-win team with Mark Jackson there? Yeah, but they became an historically great team. Like Tass is saying, they've been top two in offense and defense for basically the entire year. They have a possible MVP, a possible defensive player of the year, and the one thing they've changed from last year is their coach, so it kind of stands out yeah. as here's the change, and look at all the great things that have happened since Steve Curry. No, got you're right there. about that. I think it was Ethan Sherwood Strauss on Twitter had a great uh, tweet about what Kerr has done, the most successful lineup for the Warriors, your Curry, your Clay, your Barnes, your Draymond Green, and Bogut, they've played over 735 minutes this season. Yeah. Last year under Mark Jackson, zero. zero. Yeah. Yeah, it's That's crazy now, now, here's the thing. Kerr was helped out by the David Lee injury a little bit yeah. with having to put Draymond Green in there. 
I still think he may have figured that out. Yeah. He knew the impact that Draymond Green would have on this team, offensively and defensively, but that's a telling stat there. You could argue that Steve Kerr was actually under more pressure than Derek Fisher going to New York because there was no expectations there, whereas the Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry right now, it's a very important part of his career. They want to be contending for a championship. They brought in a rookie coach. That's a big gamble. Often you see a team when they're on the, on the, brin on the fringe of going for a championship, they want an experienced guy to take them over the line. He's actually now got this team probably as title favourites right now, Steve Kerr, mm -hmm. with no tangible weakness either. They've got a very good bench. They share the ball. They lead the league in assists. They do everything that says they are going to be one of the toughest teams to beat in the finals. If we had done the starties at the All-Star break, let's say, Budenholzer runs away with this. Have you just been impressed with how the Warriors continue to keep winning here and the Hawks, of course, have fallen off a little bit, maybe because they haven't had much to play for in terms of the number one seed? Maybe they just want to get some guys some rest. Yeah, maybe around the All-Star break would have been the perfect time for Budenholzer, the Hawks, coming off their humongous winning streak. Right. But I think he also is getting a little bit of help because the Hawks were so banged up last year. They really didn't have enough guys to finish with more than 34 wins. Everybody's been healthy for the most part this year. It's a lot easier to be better. That being said, he has got them playing as best as they ever have in their entire history. Yeah, Coach of the Year usually lean towards coaches on just really, really good teams, your 60-plus win teams, or sometimes like some of the other nominees, like Stevens, maybe Jason Kidd, coaches that took a team where you just didn't expect anything from and got them either into the playoffs or really just shocked a lot of people. Both of those guys, sort of nominees like that. Especially Jason Kidd. Uh, I know Brad Stevens has done a phenomenal job, but we didn't expect much from the Milwaukee Bucks at all after being the worst team in the league last year. Their defense uh, is just a telltale sign that their head coach has got them playing extremely hard. Yeah. And again, a second year head coach doing it. Uh, all these guys, uh, it's really difficult to sort of pare it down. But we went with the number one seeds as the top two candidates <laughs> yeah. in, in either conference, and deservedly so. I was inspired by Jason Kidd, by the way. No tie there tonight. All right, let's go back to Kristen for the next award. Wedgies are weird. It's just science. Now, when it's a bully yanking a piece of cotton up. Those are the worst, but when it's a basketball accidentally cradled between the net and the backboard, they are glorious and triumphant. These are the nominees for the Wedgie of the Year. Here they are, Anthony Tolliver, acquired by the Pistons in December in his first game with Detroit. The first minute he was on the floor, his first shot was a wedgie. He will always, always remember that moment. The second nominee, Nick Collison, the rare free throw wedgie, and I love the gooseneck just hanging it up there. Our third nominee, just because Marv Albert gave the starters a showdown during a TNT game. And now a timeout is taken. Let's take another look. The officials, Reggie, made a, made a quick call as the starters of NBA TV fame like to call it. It appeared to be a wedgie, <laughs> but it was not. And the officials said, jump ball. Thanks for that, Marv. Early in the year, DeMar DeRozan stuck a jumper. Now, you might not think it's an incredible wedgie, but it also resulted in a date for a fan of the starters. This came in. From Morgan, I met up with friends to watch some games last night when a shot by DeMar DeRozan went up, resulting in a wedgie. I immediately shouted, wedgie! To my surprise, a cute girl on the other side of the room I didn't know said the same thing at the same time. After a shocking glance at each other, we started talking. It turns out we are both marathon runners who listen to the podcast during our runs. I now have a date with this girl. Thanks, Morgan. Bringing people together. That's what wedgies do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the winner is Nick Collison's free throw. Wow. Yeah, this is a, this is a rare, rare wedgie. Mm. Oh, and, and I love how he's shot. hanging, he's hanging with the goose neck <laughs> and ends up in a wedgie. That's great stuff. Not the wedgie that brought two lovers together? Surprising. Yeah, we don't know how the date went. Coming up next, we hand out the hardware for whoopsie of the year. Welcome back to the Starties. We've already handed out six big awards, but there's still plenty to come, including the winner of this season's most valuable player trophy. When you're right, no one remembers. When you're wrong, no one forgets. And that's why we're doing our part to remember those plays that went horribly, horribly wrong this season. Here's the nominees for the whoopsie of the year, guys. First nominee, Lakers huddling up during uh, a basketball game, forgetting to play basketball. Yes, the Clippers, Blake Griffin getting the best of them. Happened in the first week of the season, and this was kind of the entire Lakers season. You get to see it that early. Yeah, it just sums it up perfectly, doesn't mm -hmm. it? That's a great one. Alexei Schwed's wild shot or pass. <laughs> to this day, no one knows whether or not that was a shot or pass. 
He didn't get a turnover on it. Uh, so that's it just his interpretation of the triangle offense, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that also sums up the Knicks season yeah, right there. Right. Both really well done. All right, third nominee for Whoopsie of the Year. It's Kirk Heinrich in the super spin cycle. <laughs> that's great. This makes me dizzy. Yeah. Watching it. Whoa, one there, and then I'm going to do it again. Hell yeah, we're going to loop it. Like make it look like guys are going to walk this shot. Austin <laughs> Rivers catches this turnover. He's like, oh. Wow. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll take that. Thank you. Last one. Steven Adams falls on the ground here and takes it right to the Hibberts. Oh. oh. <laughs> now, Steven Adams was fighting through this game, fighting through a hand injury, but that <laughs> really, really injured him. The That's delay as the ball too. comes through. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Oh, I got to take a break. Got to oh. take a break. Guys. Shake it off. Deep breath. Shake it off. And the winner is mm, the Lakers getting scored on during a huddle. Yeah, it's, it really one. does sum up the Lakers season here. Yeah. Huddling it up, I already showed Let's you. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let's, hey, do you guys want to play defense? Oh, oh, yeah. I <laughs> like that Kobe was even around for yeah. this one. It's good to see him in the award show. Yeah, yeah imagine him on, on the sidelines. Yeah, he would happen. be so mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, it's not just the blunders that we give praise to here on the starter. Sometimes it's even better when a perfectly executed play goes exactly according to plan. Lee. Take us through the nominees for very solid play of the year. The first one comes from the Atlanta Hawks. Now, how do you get a wide open layup when there are defenders in the paint? Well, this is how they do it against the Minnesota Timberwolves here. Paul Millslap finds Al Horford, Jeff Teague with a beautiful finish. You know, you guys know I love a layup. Couldn't have a very solid play of the year without the doyen, Manu Ginobili there with just a beautiful pass. Tim Duncan doesn't even know it's coming. The Golden State Globetrotters from earlier in the season executed perfectly. Oh, three man Perfect leave. play here. Draymond Green, do you think he's going to finish it? Nope. Mm, Sean Livingston nice. with the finish. And of course, the Portland Trailblazers here on a broken play are just so determined to get a three pointer out of this. Watch this. Chris Kamen's wide open. <laughs> Matthews is open. No, steps back outside, knocks it down. Beautiful. A step back on a very solid play. Yeah, yeah it's just because the play was broken. That's why. Here's your winner. The Golden State uh, Globetrotters. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. I like this one. It's a yeah. good pick. I mean, it really sums up the Golden State Warriors season as well. Everyone getting involved, beautiful teamwork. And you know as well, I love a layup. Now, it's not quite a layup, it's a dunk, <laughs> but it'll do. And that's what I call the very solid play of the year. Why is there a sticker on your plaque? Uh, well, it was player of the year, but it's just play of the year. So congratulations, Golden State Warriors. I'm sure this one will be one of the most sought after accolades for the season. Uh, we blew the entire budget on the fog machine, apparently. <laughs> could get another flag. All right, now it's on time. Oh, actually, sorry. Lee, yes, got the uh, stats here. Kaushik7 out in India has actually been uh, keeping the stats for the very solid play of the year. And as you can see here, the type of play, we've got the assists, we've got the ball fizzing around, we've got the boomerang, the bounce pass, all those great categories in there. So I think it's great that we keep track of those. And also, by team as well. Now, if someone thinks I'm biased towards the San Antonio Spurs, that's them at 15.2% in the brown. So yes, so, I yeah. probably am a little. You were right. <laughs> hey, but they deserve it. What a breakdown. Yeah, great job, Kaushik. Very much appreciated. All right, well, let's stick sort of with the stats here. It's time to unleash the fantasy unicorn for the little boy, little boy of the year, the fantasy line of the year. This is difficult to only pick three impressive lines, but our third runner, or second runner up, I should say, Clay Thompson when he went off against the Kings. 52 points, 16 of 25 shooting, nine of 10 at the line, 11 threes, two boards, five assists, four steals, and two blocks. A quarter to remember. Runner up, whoa boy, Anthony Davis. He flirted with the quadruple double. 36 points, 14 boards, seven assists, one steal, and nine blocks. A great Amazing. game from AD. But the Wobite, Wobite of the year for Fantasy Line of the Year goes to Kyrie Irving. 57 points on 20 of 32 shooting. Perfect at the line, 10 of 10. Perfect from three point land, 7 of 7. Three boards, five assists, and some defense with four steals. Kyrie, congrats on the Woboy. Apologies, I should say, to Russell Westbrook, right. yeah. James Harden, and Demarcus Cousins, who had themselves some monster lines. But in the end, there can only be three. Moving on, all season long, we've monitored the missteps of those in the NBA family, like J.R. Smith, Donald Sterling, and Dwight Howard in years past. They're always someone who rises above the rest and earns the right to receive this ultimate starter's dishonor. The 2014-2015 Worst of the Year Award goes to OKC's Dion Waiters. Dion's season actually started in Cleveland, and things looked rosy out of the gate, fresh off being mentioned in LeBron's coming home letter on SI. Waiters was named the team's starting two guard, but it only took three games for LeBron and the coaching staff to change their minds about Dion's role and send him back to the bench. What was Dion doing that was so wrong? Well, aside from missing, he was doing this. 
over and over and over and <laughs> over again. The internet loved him, but his teammates, mm, not so much. No thanks. And they were smart not to pass to him. He shot only 25.6% from three as a member of the Cavaliers. When he did get it, oh, you know he shot it. He attempted more shots per 36 minutes than Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love in his 33 games as a Cavalier. In early January, Cleveland decided it was time for Dion to be gone, sending him to the Thunder. His first few games in OKC, well, he went pretty well. And this was Waiter's explanation for the improvement. He said, listen, they give me the ball. Like, I touch the ball. Like, I actually, like, you know, touch the ball. Well, like, no, that's not true. Waiters actually touched it more with Cleveland, as NBA.com's John Schumann pointed out. What he continued to do in OKC, to the delight of social media <laughs> users everywhere, was keep calling for the ball. If you've seen one clip of Waiters this season, it has to be him begging for and being denied a pass. And it is hilarious. Vine can thank Dion for all the added views this season. He's been exceptional, and that's why he has earned the Starters 2014-2015 Worst of the Year Award. Kristen, would you do the honors in raising the banner, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, if this is perfect. JR and Dion Waiters. Yeah. Look at that. Beautiful. Got a nice round head. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Very nice. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Uh -oh. Come on, Dion. Oh, no. <laughs> Shoot your way through this, Dion. <laughs> Come on, Dion. Yeah, yes, Dion. Yeah. Oh, shot it. <laughs> Another Beautiful. miss. There we go. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> that seems no. about right. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Just a little off. Yeah. Just, just, just off to the side like it does. Yeah. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> All right, coming up, the most improved player of the year and the funniest moment of the 2014-15 season. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Starties. Before we find out this year's MVP, let's check in with the MIP. Here are the nominees for the most improved player of the year. Jimmy Butler of the Chicago Bulls. Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz. Draymond Green of the Golden State Warriors. And Hassan Whiteside of the Miami Heat. And the winner is Jimmy Butler. Wow, Jimmy Butler, the Bulls, getting the Starties Most Improved Player. Now look, this one was a split vote. We had Tass and Lee going with Draymond Green. Trey actually went with Rudy Gobert. And myself and the fans backed Jimmy Butler. So in the end, it actually came down to Trey's second place vote. You had Jimmy Butler just above Draymond Green. Controversial. Controversial, but Jimmy in the end, uh, the fans agree that he gets it. This is a weird award. Every year, it's, I think it's easily the most ridiculous sort of award that we hand out because it's, it's sort of sometimes a piece of hardware that were basing a little bit on underachievement the year prior. Right. Yeah, it's also very subjective as to what you want to determine as improvement. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. right. Like, I had trouble picking Rudy Gobert because he's a second-year player. It's also coming from France, where he just wasn't here in North mm -hmm. America. Also, just got a starter's job in the middle of the year. So I find it difficult. I like to go with a guy who's played some years in the league, and that's why I came down to Jimmy Butler and Draymond Green for me. Those two guys came out of nowhere to earn max contracts. More, more than likely this, right. off, this mm -hmm. coming off season. And to me, Draymond Green sort of came out of a deeper sense of nowhere <laughs> because we knew Jimmy Butler was a fantastic defensive player, but his offensive game came out of nowhere this season. But I think Draymond Green, the defense came out of nowhere, and I think the offense, to a degree, followed suit. That's why I went with Draymond Green, but I, I, I have no problem with Jimmy Butler. No, that's why, that's why I leaned more towards Butler. I, I, I hear the case for Draymond Green. He has been excellent. Of course, you know, a lot of us picking him for Defensive Player of the Year. Maybe that came into play, too. Sometimes with awards, you're like, well, I'm giving him Defensive sure. Player of the Year. Maybe I don't lean towards him for MIP. But Butler, already all D, to then, with all the injuries again in, in, within Chicago, to become a 20-point-per-game scorer, and really find his shot, which he had lost mm -hmm. the year before, the three-pointer, his usage rate went up. They just asked him to do a whole lot more. And I think, again, I don't love this award, but I think it's a little more impressive to go from a good player to an all-star slash great player, and that's mm -hmm. what Jimmy did this year. 
Yeah, well, I think with Draymond Green, he was on the fringe of being an all-star himself. I mean, the numbers were a double from what they were last year, which is not huge. It's still 12 and 8. But his minutes this season, he went up to 31 minutes a game. Now, that is what you're talking about with this award. Often it's a guy who just gets more minutes. But he earned those minutes. You know, he was really just a glorified energy guy prior to this season. And now he's a very, very integral part of their rotation. And Tass, like you were saying with Rudy Gobert, I think you're right that you like to look for a player who's had a little bit more experience rather than just Rudy's been in his second league. But he kind of went from a guy who nobody knew anything about to a legit franchise cornerstone. He made Ennis Cantor expendable. The reason he got a starting job is because he was so good that he basically forced out a top five pick because they needed to see him more on the court. The Jazz took off once he got a starting role. I just think it's been impressive for him to go from a nobody to a guy who, if he were a free agent, would get a max contract I, in a second. I agree. I think some people think maybe Gobert, even Whiteside, maybe did it a little too late in mm, the season sure. for yeah, different yeah. Uh, yeah. reasons. Hassan Whiteside's interesting, too. Can a, guy a can a guy win this award that wasn't really even playing in the league the last two years? I mean, he's been all over the place. China, Lebanon, the D-League, and now here he is becoming a key part for a team trying to make the playoffs. It's interesting with the Miami Heat, this is exactly the sort of player they could have used last year in the mm -hmm. paint, you know, someone who could have protected them. But he's been fantastic for a guy who, you know, he has bounced around, you mentioned, not just the NBA, but a lot of other leagues. So if he can really figure out his maturity and understand that he has got a role in this league, he could be in it for a long time. And we watched him in summer league last year, yeah. up close mm -hmm. and personal. Right. And we wondered, oh, this guy's just sort of falling off. We didn't expect him to ever have an NBA job again. Yeah unless it was sort of like a 10-day contract or something. Yeah. So, so the degree of improvement, you can probably sure. give it to Hassan Whiteside for that. Again, totally subjective. Yeah, totally subjective. It's sure. wide open, but uh, the fans agree with me and Jimmy Butler. All right, back to Kristen for our next award. On any given night, the NBA has the capacity to thrill us with thunderous dunks, awe-inspiring assists, and game-winning buzzer beaters. But when those don't happen, we are more than happy to settle for hilarious sideshows just like these. Guys, take me through the nominees for this year's funniest moment. Yeah, Jason Smith with the Knicks. The <laughs> dance party that he had in the bowels of MSG. <laughs> he's got subtle moves, he's got quite extravagant moves, <laughs> but he just has a whole lot of moves. This is the highlight of the Knicks season, really, right? Yeah, like the leg, yeah, the dancing <laughs> moves for a seven footer or near seven footer are pretty impressive. The modern day Mark Madsen. Come on, yeah. he's bringing it right there. This move. I love this. I think this should be the funniest moment of the year. Chris Paul pulling a Kevin Hart right here, yelling at DeAndre to just shout at! Doesn't even come up to his shoulders. No. Nah. Yell at his face. Just how angry he is. Why is DeAndre waiting? No one yeah. knows. Referee Scott Foster in the back there as well is great. Everyone's confused yeah. on this particular play. Another nominee for funniest moment of the year. Jeff Skin Wade interviewing Chandler Parsons. Dirk says, nah. <laughs> Interview's over. I love the reactions from Chandler looking at Dirk. I love how Skin <laughs> sort of knows it's coming, but then quickly tries to get everything. Yeah. It's perfect. He, should, he said, I should have been ready for the big German. Yeah. Knew he was coming. Eric Spolstra doesn't like Mario Chalmers' turnover here, the last nominee. Oh, God, where is LeBron when you need him? Like somebody just blowing on his makes neck. Me so mad. What a great moment. Oh, I just blow a gasket. <laughs> tries to hold it in. And the winner is, oh yeah, Dirk slapping Skin Wade's mic to the floor. Yes, I mean, we're going to have to divvy up this award it's, to some extent. Does it go yeah. to team effort? Jeff, does it go to Chandler, goes to Dirk? An incredible clip, and we actually have the honor of uh, having an acceptance speech from Jeff Skin Wade himself. Wow, thank you guys. This is a huge honor. And to send me a dirt bobblehead, I don't know where I would have been able to get one of these, but a few people to thank, my, my wife, my kids, World Be Free, and not even necessarily in that order. You know, Bernard King, Snoop Dogg, Willie Nelson, Dougie Fresh, all people that have had a big influence on me. But I really want to thank Dirk for teaching me the valuable lesson that once you got something in your hands, you hang on to it, and you don't let anybody take it from you no matter, no matter what. Wow, Dirk bobblehead. Yeah, it's mine. Thanks. Oh. But he earned that. He earned that. That's good. I'm going to give that to him. So thank you guys for giving me that to give to Amar. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Skin Wade, there with the Mavericks. Awesome job. Great uh, broadcast booth. Mm -hmm. And the a well-deserving win. Best acceptance speech in this show, I'd say. I, I, would, I would think so. All right. Look, I'm dreading this next part of the show, and uh, I'll let uh, Kristen explain why. Well, as with any NBA season, it's not all smiles dunks and wedgies and sadly every year things disappear from our NBA lives forever. Please join Skeets, Tass, Trey and Lee as they say goodbye to everything we lost this season. So good.
goodbye and farewell, my old friend. After all these years, we finally reached the end. I have kept you close, but all good things must pass, and it seems that we must part at last. Yes, goodbye and farewell to you now, for I know that I must take my leave somehow, and there really is not all that much to say. But it seems that I must leave and go away Memories may fade throughout the years But the best of them remain While the worst ones disappear Good times can never be erased Nor my feelings for you ever be replaced So goodbye and farewell, my old friend. We have finally reached the rainbow's end. Though I must depart and leave for somewhere new, still I always will remember you. Welcome back to the Stardies. It is time for the granddaddy of them all. Every time we're certain a player has locked up the season's most valuable player award, somebody comes along with a spectacular performance that brings us all back to square one. But now it is finally time to put that second guessing to rest. Here are this year's MVP nominees. Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors. LeBron James of the Cleveland Cavaliers. James Harden of the Houston Rockets. And Russell Westbrook of the OKC Thunder. And the winner is Stephen Curry. Chef Curry with the MVP from the Stardies. I almost feel dirty in a way, <laughs> handing out this award before the end of the regular season. Mm -hmm. But, that, could happen. but hey, the Stardies are scheduled. <laughs> They're scheduled is. on the program. We had to get our votes in. Four of us went with Steph Curry. So Lee, Tass, myself, and the fans, again, on Facebook. Trey, the only one putting his vote behind James Harden. Yeah, we've talked about this MVP race all season Once long. Once or twice, yeah. Yeah, it feels like every, uh, every second day on the show, and every second day on the show, you really can make a case for one of the other guys, be it Westbrook or Harden, mm -hmm. Anthony Davis, LeBron, but... In the end, you guys are looking at Curry's entire season and just the fact how great the Golden State Warriors are? Well, there's a lot of things. Uh, obviously, he doesn't have the individual points per game that James Harden has. But are we going to punish Steph for not playing fourth quarters because his team is too good? Not me. Because his team is going to have probably about 10 more wins than the Houston Rockets when all said and, said and done. I think you have to credit him for that. I think also what we sort of lose is Steph Curry kind of changes the way the other team plays defense. And James Harden, uh, he does that to a degree, but people worry about Steph as soon as he crosses the midcourt line. Well, James Harden is more of a one-on-one -on -one player, and you, you kind of just get ready for him in that way. And I think extra points for a guy who kind of changes the game. Uh, so... So many factors go yeah. into it. Mm -hmm. Harden has obviously been incredible, but I don't care that he hasn't played fourth quarter minutes. When you look at points per possession, you want to get really geeky. They're really, really close in how much sure. they actually produce each possession down the floor. Yeah, it's clear that no one is really superior than yeah. any of these nominees. But So that's why I sort of just tried to almost take it to its core and went, He's the best player on the best team, on a historic team. I think mm -hmm. that needs to be said, too, in terms of offensive and defensive sure. and the numbers they're putting up. 
That's why I went with Curry. Again, the numbers are so close for all of these guys. Yeah, the numbers are so close, but the one thing we all know that's different is that James Harden has hit big shot after big shot after big shot this season, and that kind of means something to me. He is first in clutch points, seventh in assists, and when it comes down to it in the final three minutes of the game, you know it is on James Harden to get the Rockets a win, and he's come through more often than he hasn't. Just because, like you were saying, Tass, he is the best one-on-one -on -one player in the league. It's not to discredit Curry because he's not playing fourth quarters, but the fact that James Harden is playing in those fourth quarters and is dominating him, I think is pretty impressive. To me, the MVP is someone who is not only good, but he also makes his teammates better, and I think that really sums up Stephen Curry's season this year. Clay Thompson was an all-star. Draymond Green's been fantastic. Andrew Bogut's having a great season. Maurice Spates is having a great season. I think all those factors lead from Steph Curry at the front showing the way. You know, he scores well, he gets yeah, assists, he agree, gets yeah. everyone touches. And Steve Kerr, as a coach, we always talk about a coach wants the point guard to be an extension of the coach. I think he goes out there and executes so well. Steph Curry's maybe the greatest shooter we've ever seen in this game, but he doesn't go out there just chasing his own shots. He shoots when he's in rhythm and when it's in the flow of the offense, but he also knows that it's just as important to make sure everyone else gets a touch on the ball. And that, for me, was what decided it over James Harden. James Harden has been incredible this season. Again, four or five of these guys. Westbrook, mm -hmm. what he's done with the OKC Thunder, keeping them in the race. Of course, LeBron James. This is what's funny about the MVP regular season award it's you know what happens if LeBron takes the Cavs to the finals and they win a title yeah and I, I know again this is just for the regular season so we're looking at that but it sort of changes sort of looking back at everything it'd be it's weird not to think of him as the MVP then well and it's weird not to think of LeBron as the MVP when I think we would all agree that he's still been the best player in the league this season he just took two weeks yeah. off to yeah. kind of get himself right and it didn't really happen for LeBron until the second half of the season Though, since the second half of the season, he's clearly been the best player on the court. Yeah, yeah. it's just odd when when the best player in the game sits down for mm -hmm. two weeks. That's pretty unprecedented mm -hmm. right. for a guy to say, I'm not the best player in the league. I got to take a break. Mm -hmm. So uh, these guys, the other guys have been doing it all year, even though Curry's not playing in fourth quarters, him and Harden and Westbrook when he has been healthy. I think that's a knock against yeah. him because he has been sort of unhealthy. You, you kind of have to give it to the other guys, to me. I couldn't give it to LeBron because he said, I'm not the best for two, two sure. weeks of the season. <laughs> Anthony Davis, too. I mean, again, not on the, uh, the panel's picks for the nominees, but this guy is going to end with a historic player efficiency rating yeah, and for, for the Pelicans. I, he's done it all. I, I do think when we get to the actual votes and the people placing their votes, they'll even look at him and go, he's going to win probably three or four of these down the line. So... All of these other guys that we just named, uh, maybe I'll lean towards them because I could see AD winning so many of these. Yeah, the might not even be his peak. Right? Yeah. That's no. just, he's crazy. just got to get through a full season as well. That's what's the knock on him right now. He's a little bit injury prone. That's absolutely right. Well, the awards have all been handed out, but one honor remains. A place in the starters' top ten plays of the year. See who makes the list when the starties return. Welcome back to the Starties. It's time for the Starters' Top 10 Plays of the Year. Never an easy task, whittling it down to just 10, but I think we nailed it. I think we I'm nailed sorry. it. Let's get to it at number 10. It's Canada versus France. It's Andrew Wiggins on Rudy Whoa. Gobert. Yeah. Maple Jordan on the Stifle Tower. Got the best of them on this play. They went at it a couple times. That was beautiful. This season. Two feet, one dribble, no problem. Oh, he's explosive. Mm -hmm. At number nine, Russell Westbrook goes coast to coast after a made basket. Bye, see ya, adios, ciao, ciao. Goes by every player. That's after a made basket. That's very generous of the broke Sixers him. to open up and allow him to dunk like yeah, that. Yeah, he broke his mask as well. <laughs> no big deal. At number eight, KJ McDaniels says no oh. to the Raptors. Now, you played volleyball. I, I, I'm just telling you, that is all-American volleyball status right there. Perfect form as well. Two-star oh, athlete. My goodness, like set him up. Huge. Staying in Toronto, Terrence Ross provided us with some serious highlights this year. Yeah. That's a nasty alley-oop. Even he said this was the best dunk of his career. Hard to argue. He just comes up with dunk after dunk after dunk. A little unheralded, I would say. Oh. At number yeah. six. Uh, Lee helped make this. Oh, list. yeah. Because yeah. Ginobili's on it with being in the back pass. Is just beautiful. I'd call that a very solid play if I hadn't already handed out the uh, trophy for yeah, that. Yeah, that is. I mean, look, that's <laughs> very solid. Very solid and top 10 worthy. <laughs> At number five, Wilson Chandler goes by Chandler Parsons and then throws it down on Tyson. Oh, yeah. oh Chandler. Chandler to Chandler violence? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Could he be dunking any harder? <laughs> nice. How high he gets up. <laughs> I see what he did there. Uh, at number four, Derek Williams for about a week during the season started to get into the oh, oh, poster making yeah. business. Uh, the wind up on this is crazy. And this one in particular, probably his best on Bismack Biombo, a great shop locker. Bring in the biz. <laughs> <laughs> at
At number three, James Ennis on Rasul Butler. This was the second night of the season. We kind of pondered, is this going to be the best dunk of the year? Oh, yeah. Oh, it got close. Firm. It got close. Only two plays top this one. And yeah, we say it's the best dunk on someone. That's a spoiler mm -hmm. there for you. Number two, a little love for J.R. Smith in the garden. Oh, yeah. With the That's oop, puts incredible. it down between the legs, the slow-mo. Watch your head. Yeah. Wow. That is unbelievable athleticism, really, from that guy to catch it and throw it down reverse in the air. Amazing. Full extent. Had to help that it was against his old team. Though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this is even more amazing. Number one, the no-looker Booker from Trevor Booker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Is this really a play, though? I mean, this is this a, a once-in-a-lifetime highlight. It is volleyball skill. I <laughs> yes. will give you that. Yes, right. That's in Quinn Snyder's playbook. We know yeah. that. Lee, you could go with dunks, but you're going to see dunks again. Yeah, you may that's never true. see this play. It's true. It's true. It's an incredible play. Of your life. So Trevor Booker with the top 10 play of the season. Agree, disagree, let us know on Twitter. Hashtag the starters. Pretty impressive. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you again I've for being here again. I mentioned that you need a fifth starter. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I would add some height to the roster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exciting evening. Of we don't want that. That's yeah. true. That's true. It's kind of a lie. Have fun, everybody. Drive safe. Test. Take us home. Thank you for joining us on this monumentous occasion. And remember, you can't finish something unless you start it first. Grace the night, people.